now we have um, Msande Sunday, yeah. talking to us about junk hacking um, to skill up. All right. Okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So thanks for coming to attend my talk. Um, so yeah, the title of my talk is Junk Hacking to Scale Up, Learning Through um, Reversing Embedded Devices, in which I plan to share my personal journey in hacking a particular consumer product and sharing some useful tools and techniques which might be helpful for your own projects. Um, the overarching goal of this presentation is to provide a sense, can you guys hear me right? Okay, the overarching goal of this presentation is to provide a sense that Opening up and trying to understand how things work on the inside is a good way to approach your learning. So just a bit about myself. So I'm a security consultant at MWR, where I spend most of my time assessing web and mobile applications. Um, I actually studied here in Cape Town. I just did a degree in electrical and computer engineering. And as many of you know, universities typically um, approach learning from starting from first principles, work your way up until you can actually build something. So this is actually the first time where I start from a finished product, working my way backwards and trying to understand how things work. So yeah, before I actually get into what I looked into, I'll just talk about my inspiration. So there's this YouTube channel run by a user named Live Overflow, where he does on the point short hacking tutorials about cryptography, reverse engineering, things like that. Um, so at the beginning of the year, he released a two-part series where he reversed this particular device. It's, a, it's called a personal cloud device by Ionic. Basically, it's a Wi-Fi enabled file share, so you can connect to it and get um, files off it. But the point of it is that he found multiple vulnerabilities in it, which allowed him to get shell on this device. It looked interesting, it looked fun. I was wondering, could I do the same? So I had a look on Take A Lot. Uh, to see if there's anything that matches this description, I came across something called a personal cloud storage and media streamer. So how this thing works is you've got an SD card, you put media files on it, such as MP3s, MP4s, you plug it in, you turn it on, and then with like your tablet or cell phones, you can install that app in it and then connect to this device and then stream content. So I was like, okay, that's a reasonable thing to want to have. Can I hack it? Oops. So, yeah, so many of you know, who are on the offensive side of security probably know there's this obsession with getting um, of unauthorized code execution or a shell on a device. And the quickest way of getting that is finding the low-hanging fruit. So to find out what are the low-hanging fruit, you need to find out what is actually running on this device. So one way of doing this is asking it what services are running. Um, so how this is practically done is you tell uh, and map the device. Um, so yeah, this was the list that came up. Um, so if your strategy at this point was to poke at the first service and, walk, and then work your way down, you'd have been in luck because the first thing that was there was Talnet and it had weak guessable credentials of admin and admin. So within 10 minutes of buying the device, opening it, I had a root shell on the device. I, I, I hadn't learned anything at this point, so I said, okay, I'm gonna ignore this and move on. So I thought to myself, so I'm quite familiar with mobile applications, so let me start with what I know best. Um, and the reason why I like starting with mobile applications is because mobile applications provide a detailed description of how to use a specific API. The, in this case, there's an application running on this device that exposes some API. So it exposes what functions can be called, what arguments do these functions need, and what data types the arguments uh, are. So the reason why you can do this is because Android applications are easily de decompilable, especially if they're written in Java. So there's various Java decompilers out there, such as JD, JDX, CFR, Finflower, how this actually looks. Um, so, yeah, so I opened this um, application up. It's called, it was called Cloud Center, right? Um, I opened it up in a decompiler. I think it was JDX. Um, so yeah, basically how it looks is you can get back the Basically, the functions that are being called that are in this application, um, the data types of these, the data types of the arguments, the names of the variables, things like that. Um, so it looks pretty much how I imagine the source code to look, right? So after reading the source code for a while, I came across 
something that looks like this. They were creating a gate request where they qu were constructing uh, in the gate parameter. They had uh, a gate parameter had, that had the value of like RM and make dir and move move. So I did a search for the source code for this specific string and it came up with multiple places. So seeing this, I'm like, okay, can I change that? Because RM, make dir and move all look like Linux command. So I'm like, okay, let me change that to to my own command and see if I can get command injection. Um, so I captured one request, which was the gate parameters look something like that. Um, so like in the CMD gate parameter, you got the value of Mector and then it, the name is the folder that is created. So I changed the command to try ping myself. That failed. So I'm like, okay, maybe they're doing something right there. So I moved on and I tried to append my command to the end of the file. That also failed. So I realized I just needed to play around with quotation marks. Um, so I added two double quotes and I got a ping back. I think the best way to show this is with a demo. <laughs> okay, um, let's see. Hello. Did you guys see that? <laughs> okay, let me just do this. Okay. So let me just show you the script that I created for this. Um, so basically, I've got this that get um, that request that I captured. Um, what I'm doing is adding a new user called backdoor user into the etc password file and then afterwards connecting it with Talnet, right? So I'm creating a new user on the device so that I can connect it to Talnet. It should work, but yeah, <laughs> let's see. Okay. Uh, no, I don't need to. Running, okay. Created a new user, now I've got a Talnet connection to it, and I can cat etc password. So using that command injection, create a new user, connect with Um And clap if you want. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, so everything runs in root on this device. Um, there's only one. <laughs> okay, so at this point, I'm like, okay, I haven't learned anything. Um, well, I, I use the skills that I've, I uh, normally use in web application assessments, but I wanted to know if I can use the fact that I've got physical access to this device to, to sort of get um, the applications off it, maybe dump the firmware. Um, so... I was not experienced this, so I did a lot of research and saw what people do online. And actually, I found out this is actually a common problem that hardware hackers have. So there's a security researcher named Natalie Sobanovich who works at Project Zero, where she hacked a Tamagotchi, which is a virtual pet, right? Um, the later releases of this virtual pet had these figures, the screen thing on the right, that you can attach to the top of it, right? Um, what she found is that um, she couldn't control where in memory code is being executed with this figure and she wanted to dump the firmware. Um, but also the thing that you could do with this figure is display images on the Tamagotchi and these images are stored in memory, right? So she wrote shell code and embedded it in an image and then point, using the fact that you could point in in memory and execute the code there, she executed code from her image, which was a shell code, and what the shell code did was to dump the firmware out of one of the buttons. So she used one of the input buttons and an output so that she could dump the firmware. I was quite impressed with that, but luckily for me, it was it didn't get that complicated. Um, but yeah, for me to get started with this, I needed to find out what is actually running on this device. So I opened it up, and this is what I found. So it had it was it had a Rawlink R two five three five zero MIPS processor, which ran at three hundred and sixty megahertz. Um, it's got thirty two megabytes of RAM, which is the blue, the blue that long blue chip there. Then up on top of it, it's there's an eight megabyte flash. 
Once you turn the device around, um, you see there's a SD card reader. But then on the top, there's these nine gold pads. Um, so I came across a blog called Dave TTY S0, and he defined, he, he describes a way of how you can dump firmware by trying to find serial ports. Um, and what serial ports are normally used for is to sort of spit out debug messages or also to interact the device while you're still developing this thing. Um, so what he says you should do is, um, for serial communications, you'll normally have four pins, a VCC ground, TX pin, and an RX pin, right? Um, so he says, okay, if you find something that sort of matches this description, you need to find these pins. So you can make educated guesses, right? In my case, I could see there was a ground pin and there was a, on the far right, there's like a 3.3 .3 volt label. So I knew those were the ground and uh, VCC pins. Um, but then, yeah, the, basic the assumptions were that with VCC pin, it will always stay at a constant voltage of 3.3 .3 volts when the thing is on. Then ground pin, it will be zero volts. The TX pin, when data is being transmitted out of this thing, it will fluctuate. And the RX pin, which is when you're sending. Okay. Um, so when you're sending data to this device, you pull the RX pin down. Um, yeah, but that's unimportant right now. So because I want to see if I can, if this is actually a debug pin. So I sold it on. What is going on? Uh, Um, no, there's a slide missing. Oh, no, there isn't. Okay. So I sold it on breakaway pins onto those pads, four of them. And then I connected jumper cables, which go to a USB to UART converter, which is that red thing there. What basically that does, it takes the silicons that come out of this device and converts it into a format that my laptop can understand. And then uh, part of this is also trying to determine what the board rate is. Um, basically, what board rate is, is trying to know how many bits per second does this device spit out. Um, so two ways of finding this is actually reading the processor data sheet or just taking educated guess because there are common board rates that you can use. So yeah, let me try to demonstrate how this actually looks. All right. All right, so the same guy who runs the blog, Dave TTY, is sort of created a tool called boardrate.py, which basically um, tries different board rates to see if um, if any data is coming out of this device that it can understand. So firstly, if, if you've got the wrong board rate, you'll get nonsensical data coming out. But once you get to the right board rate, you'll get ASCII test. Test. OK, so let me start this tool. OK, so it's trying that board right here, 115200. So when I start it up, it doesn't understand what it's spitting out. So if I change the board rate to that, still nothing, nothing, nothing. Okay, I'm getting full stops. Ah, right. Now I'm getting printable ASCII characters. So at this point now, I can only get data coming out of this device. I can't actually interact with it. So I need a serial terminal to connect to this thing. Um, so I'm going to stop this and then. Use my notes to understand it. Okay, so I'm still going to debug those out debug messages coming out, but also now I can interact with it. So I'm just going to wait for some of the debug messages to stop until I can maybe interact with it. Yeah. So there again, I've got a, sort of a shell on the device with debug messages still in between. Uh, but uh, I can type etc password again to get the user. Uh, so yeah, I've got a shell again, but now. Uh, I wanted the firmware of this device. So there is a character device in the dev folder. 
which is called MTD block, which maps onto the, um, to the flash memory. So if you cat one of these files out to, for instance, the SD card, you can get a dump of the, the flash. Um, yeah, let me get back to my slides. Okay. So, <laughs> thank you. Okay. So, with with that shell, I was able to get uh, dump the firmware, um, but I didn't really know what was involved in the what makes up of a firmware image. So, did a bit of research online, and I found out that a firmware image is can basically basically be broke, broke, uh, broken up into three parts. So, firstly, you've got the bootloader, which is when you turn on the device. This is the first program that runs, and it initializes the hardware and then loads up the kernel. Um, we'll come back. Yeah. So once the kernel is started, the kernel does what it does. In this case, it was Linux, um, and the kernel will move on to load the root file system. Um, so, so, um, so yeah, this command here is what I use to dump the um, the flash image. And then you can use tools like Binwalk or Firma Mod Kit to analyze this firmware image to see what are the sections um, of the firmware image. So you can see at hex address 17.5b0, there's the U-boot. Yeah, there's the U-boot. And, and then at address 50,000, there's a Linux kernel, kernel image. And then at 18.2e f3, there's a root file system, which is of the Squatch FS file format. Um, so it, it matched up with the expectation of what I read online. I was happy about that. So what from there I dumped, I got all, I extracted the file system and then got the applications off it. Um, so once I got the applications off it, I found that there's one of these one of these applications called mini DLNA that's on it, right? What this application? Don't really know. Should I plug it in and out again just to? Okay. So yeah, so the mini D DLNA application is used to serve files to client applications that's on the network. So this is your the app that is installed on your mobile phone or on your tablet, right? So why this is an interesting target or application is because this application passes media files and passing media files is quite a difficult thing to do. Um, this is just what you, you know, you hear from security researchers online. So it's a good candidate for trying to find memory corruption bugs. So there's two ways you can go about finding these bugs. Um, so you can do it dynamically, where you take an M uh, MP3 file, MP4 file, and then change random parts of it, like literally flipping random bits and bytes, open it up with the application, and seeing if the application crashes. Ideally, you want to do this thousands of times. Um, but there is a bit of a high setup cost on this, because you need to be able to um, restart the application if it crashes, collect, debug. Uh, no, uh, crash dumps and also like the input. So there's just, there's just a lot involved with it. Second approach is statically where you can just, you read the source code. Um, so this application is an open source application. So since I had access to the, um, the binary of it, I stringed it for the version. I mean, I grabbed it for the version and then got the version of it. So then downloaded the source code of it and then got the latest source code and then compare these two source code bases to see if there's any security bug fixes. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I'm using a tool here called MALD, which um, opens up the two source code bases and shows you the differences. So in the second line, you can see they fixed the string copy into a string end copy, which, and string copies are normally um, signs of there's a potential buffer overflow in this application. So if I remove the unimportant details, what this code basically does is it forms a SQL request, um, and then from that, um, so there's a database on this device, it forms a SQL request and then gets the album 
which is album name from this result, and then create an object which is of the type struct virtual item. And then following this, um, it checks if the album, if it returned results for the album, and if it did, it just copies it into this last album dot name buffer. Um, the problem is that it doesn't check that the last album dot name buffer will able to um, fit the data that is coming from album. Um, so just a quick primer on buffer overflows. So why this is a problem is because um, tr I'm trying to, so in C and C++, if you try to put more data than a buffer can handle, um, C, um, C will allow you to do that and it will overwrite adjacent memory. And the result of this is that you can overwrite um, important addresses that are in memory, such as function pointers, return addresses. Um, and then since you can overwrite these addresses, you can redirect your code um, to another location and in the worst case, um, cause arbitrary code execution. Um, but there are two conditions to be able to exploit a buffer overflow. So firstly, you need to be able to pass um, user controllable data to um, the application. So in my case, the um, this string that was vulnerable was, or um, the part of the empathy file that was vulnerable was the album name. So I could just change the album name to whatever I wanted and then open up in the application and it will crash. So yeah, check. The second one was I need to be able to trigger the code that has a string copy in it. So this application used uh, the iNotify subsystem, which basically monitors for read and write in a specific directory. And once a read and write event occurs, it calls a function which resulted in this specific function being called. So I could trigger this code quite reliably. Um, so yeah, to test that theory, I just changed the album name of an MP3 file and then uploaded it. Tried 100 crash, Charles, no crash. Tried 1,000, no crash. Tried 10,000, I got a crash. But I don't know why it crashed. Um, so I need to debug now. <laughs> so there's two approaches that I could have done for debugging, local debugging, where I use something like Cremo to emulate a MIPS processor. And then in this, once I've got an em emulated MIPS processor, I install a MIPS-based Linux, and then I install GDB, and then start this application and attach it so that I can actually debug it. But this approach for me seemed like it's gonna take a bit of time and I was not too familiar with a lot of the tools here, so I skipped to the next approach, which is remotely debugging it. So what you do in this case, you upload a GDB server onto the NVIDIA device, and then you just start the GDB server and it'll connect to that mini DLNA process. And then from your local machine using GDB, you can debug this device. Um, so yeah, that's what I did. After debugging it for a while, I realized that from like reading a line um, how to exploit stack, I mean buffer overflows, normally this will happen on the stack, but in my case, it was a little bit different. So when the, an operating system starts an application, it allocates um, certain parts of memory for this application, right? So the ones that you um, developers and other people are mostly familiar with is like the stack, the stack, the heap, right? Where the stack is where it stores local variables. So when you're calling a function, all those variables within the function are normally stored in the stack. And a heap is when you, heap is the area where dynamic memory is allocated. So when you call malloc and things like that. The BSS section is where static uninitialized variables are stored, which in my case, that static lost ob album object was Static, yeah. <laughs> so um, when I was overflowing the name buffer, I, I overwrote a function pointer. The thing that I needed to, be, to consider is because if I added too much data to the last album dot name buffer, I would overwrite a mutex lock and the application would crash in a way that is not exploitable. So I needed to play within that bigger room I had there. But yeah, the point is now I could overwrite a function pointer and I realized I could control where the code is going to execute next. So normally what will happen at this point, you would generate shell code with a tool like MSF Venom, create your exploit, exploit the device, get a shell. But in my case, things were different. Um, so the album name is stored as a UTF-8 string. What this practically means for me is that, uh, so 
this table here is basically just it's showing so for each byte, right, it, it can be represented by two hexadecimal di digits ranging from zero to f. So you got zero zero at the top and then ending at f f. So these are all the values you can have for a byte representing hexadecimal. Um, I could only use the bytes in the green range from zero all the way to seven f. Anything in the yellow range had to follow specific rules, um, which meant that the shell code that I was generating with MSF Venom or, in, with, or other export development tools didn't have encoders to make it UTF compatible. Um, so this was quite a problem. So I thought, okay, if there isn't um, UTF-8 encoders for MIPS, I need to try find another buff overflow so that I can get a shell on this device. So I found other places where there was a buff overflow. So the artist name, the album name, the genre name, the date taken name of an MP3 file could cause this buff overflow. Um, but they all had the same restriction of UTF compatible shellcode. So yeah, it seems like I'm gonna have to try write UTF compatible shellcode. So I generated an MS, uh, using MS Venom uh, MIPS reverse shell shellcode, which basically what that does is when this thing runs on the device, I get a connection back to me, and then I can remotely control this device. So I took each instruction of the shell code, right? Um, and tried to, okay, let me go through this example, yeah. So on the left-hand side, you've got the same big instruction of one instruction, which is in this case, move the, I mean, add the value zero to the SP register and store it in the A zero register. The machine code representation is 2020A003. The problem is now that A0 is in that range that I don't want, uh, which, uh, yeah, so I had to change the instruction to something that does the equivalent thing, but still that, that doesn't have this A0 in it. So basically, once I swapped A0 and SP in the instruction, it was in a format that didn't have that restriction. So I'm like, okay, I could do this for each instruction in the shell code. Okay, I moved on to another instruction, such as adding zero to 160, the storage in the A1 register. Uh, the equivalent is, uh, instruction was adding 10 to the A1 register and then shifting it left by four, which is basically times it by 160 for those who are familiar with binary. <laughs> so it got complicated real quickly when stuff like this happened. <laughs> So I'm like, okay, okay, no, I, 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 can't, I, really, I can't do this. So I'm gonna need to try find another place in memory where I can store my shell code. So I read the source code, I gave up, I read the source code, gave up over and over again. Um, but then that um, earlier example I showed you with the Tamagotchi where, the late, uh, where Natalie um, put her shell code image, I mean shell code in an image, uh, seemed relevant here. Yeah. So the mini DLNA application passes the album art out of an uh, MP3 file, right? And then, so an, uh, an album art image is a JPEG image, and JPEG images doesn't have this UTF-8 restriction. And what I found when the application crashed, this uh, JPEG image was in memory. So I could use the JPEG image to put my shellcode in it. So to test this, I embedded a unique string into an image um, and then added an image to the cover art of an MP3 file. And then ran the application until it crashed once I uploaded the MP3 image. And then there's a useful GDB plugin called uh, PwnDBG, which has a command called vmap, which will give you all the, like the area of the heap on the stack, and I knew that the image was going to be in the heap. So yeah, I found the address range of the heap. One way of, other way of doing this is just catching um, the proc maps file of uh, this process. Um, so I tried to search um, memory for my string, but GDB kept failing. So a workaround of this, I just dumped the heap into a file and then manually searched the file for my string. What I found is that the string is always in a different location every single time I run this. So it's not in a fixed location in memory. 
So I needed to build a shellcode that is reliable so that it's always in that location that I want it to be in memory. So what I did is took NOP instructions, which is an instruction that does nothing, and appended it to my shellcode to make my shellcode really big so it's in a certain place in memory. And then I, I sort of stitched many of these payloads together so that just to make it more reliable. So a summary of what I need to do to exploit this thing. So I need to generate a MIPS shellcode with using a tool like MSF Venom, and then add my knob sled, and then chain it together. And then add this JPEG image into, so add the shellcode to the JPEG image, and then add the JPEG image to MP3 file. And then start a netcat listener on my device, upload this MP3 image, and then wait for a shell. So let's see if it works. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I can't really see. Uh, um. No. Okay, so. Oh, my battery is dying. So my, um, this device had an SMB share. So I could connect to it. Um, so this directory here is connected to this SMB share into it, so I can get the files that are in a specific directory, but I'm only restricted to this directory. On my machine here, I've created this malicious MP3 file, which has got my shellcode embedded into it. So what I've got to do here is start a Netcat listener. Okay. <laughs> and then, okay, let me just copy it. Okay. okay, so the listener started. Copy it onto the device now. Wait. <laughs> let me check something first. Um, am I actually connected? Yes. Am I on the same metrics? The public, you know. There it is. Okay. So there's still a connection to the site. So let's start the listener. Okay. Uploading it. And there's a connection back. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, so after this, I don't know, I'll, I'll just wrap up. So the conclusion is that embedded devices are a great way to learn about various aspects of um, security because there's things like network services, there's mobile apps that sometimes come with it, there's actual hardware, and then there's web, there was a web application on this device that I didn't actually um, look at. Um, I'm still trying to find a way to write UTF-8 compatible shellcode. I've got an idea where you could do this generically. Um, but there may be a future project. Um, and Natalie in her talk made a good point about reverse engineering. She said, I just wanted to have fun. You know all those cool kids go out, go to class? They just haven't discovered reverse engineering yet. <laughs> okay. Okay, questions. Yes. Uh -huh. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I did report this to the regional manufacturer. I got no emails back from them. Um, so this product was rebranded by another company. I did send them an email. And they said, oh, give me a call back, and then they never called back. So yeah. what can I do? <laughs> Uh -huh. um, 
in terms of hours, I would say maybe about a hundred or so. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was like two weeks research almost every day, and then a few hours after hours. <laughs>